Okay, well, let's get started. This might be our Saturday uh, evening group for tonight. So uh, let's do our opening prayers. And uh, let's see, uh, Gary hasn't done them for a little while. Would you mind doing the opening prayers this evening, Gary? Okay, we're going to uh, uh, do two repetitions and then the uh, Tibetan. Uh, whatever you care to do. Oh, it's up to me? I'll leave it up to you. Well, we'll do two repetitions and then my tortured Tibetan will. Okay, we'll go. Well, that's how you get practice. And Okay. Put the electrodes on so that if you mess up, we can we can give you the we can give you the little the little charge. Yeah, hand me the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I we're gonna have fun tonight. Okay. All right. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Dagla dang war je pedra, no par je pe keg. Tharpa dang tham che kien pe bardu cho par je pe tham che ke so je pe. Manam ka dang yam pe sem chen tham che de wa dang den. Dug nao dang drill nyur du la na me pa yang dag par zo pe chan. Churin poche to parja. Action Bodhicitta Prayer. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. De che du sang ma ge ki bar du na gi sung ge wa la ko. Ma she bar du na gi sang ge wa la ko. Du de ring ne sung te ni ma sang da sang ji bar du na gi sang ge wa la ko. Long Refuge Prayer. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Adams. We take refuge in all of the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root and lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Grinchen Sawa Dang Ju Par Pao den la ma dam pa nam la kyab su chi o. I dam kyo kor ji la tso dam la kyab su chi o. Sang je chong den de nang la kyab su chi o. Dam pe cho nam la kyab su chi o. Fag pe jen dun nam la kyab su chi o. Pao Kandro Cho Kyong Sung Mei Song Ye She Ki Chen Dang Den Pa Nam La Kyab Su Chi O.
taking the Bodhisattva vow. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Jang chu ming pur chi ki bar sang che nam la kyab su chi cho dang jang chu sim pe so la yang den shen kyab su chi ji tar nong ji de she ki jang chu du ni che pa dang Jang chu sim pe la pa la de dang rim shen ne pa tar de shing dro la ben don du jang chu sen ni ke je shing de shing du ni la pa la rim pa jin du la pa ji. Short Refuge Prayer in the Buddha the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sang J Cho Dang So Ki Cho Nam La Chang Chu Bar Du Dag Ni Kyab Su Chi Dag Ji Jen So Ji Pe So Nam Ki Dro Lin Pin Cheer Sam J Dru Par Sho. The Four Immeasurables. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Ma nam kya dang yam pe sem chen tam che de wa dang de we ju dang den par jur chi. Du nyao dang du nyao ji ju dang dra war ju chi. Du nyao me pe de wa dang ni dra war ju chi. Ne ring chak dang ni dang dra we tang yom le ne par ju chi. I think you're muted, Lance. Oh, wrong button. Yes, thank you. Yes, we'll have a short meditation. Uh, so sit in the seven point posture of Baranchana. Most important feature is keeping our back straight and breathe deeply, hold the breath, watch the breath, then exhale completely. Watch the breath and breathe in again at your own pace. So we'll just have a a uh, three minute meditation like this, just to relax. So begin.
Okay. Thank you very much. So last week, as you might remember, we were talking about the um, white tar practice. So doing a sadhana practice. And um, does anybody have any questions or anything about the practice that we did last week that we should talk about tonight? So everybody is good with that. Everybody's got a copy. Thomas may not have a copy of the Deity Yoga book. Um, this book here, Thomas, is uh, it's got um, 11 different practices in here. And uh, there are practices that we do most often at uh, Dharma Surya and the other uh, Kenpo um, Sando Dharma centers. So if uh, you would like a copy of that, I can send you a copy of that. And also, I don't know if you got this book. Um, I should have sent you this last time when I, ju I just sent you the, uh, this, this book here. You just got that. But I didn't put this one in. I should have thought about that, and I didn't. You know, so uh, I'll send you a copy of that. And if you would like the sadhana book, I can send that to you. Do you have sadhanas that you like to practice from time to time, Thomas? Your microphone is on. Please repeat your last sentence. I was asking if you have uh, uh, sadhanas, if you have you know, texts that you recite, different deity yoga practices that you perform um, for your practices. Do you, do you have anything like that? Yeah, not from the Garchan people. Okay. Would you like a copy of that book? Yes, that would be fantastic. Okay, good. All right. All right. Is there anything else that you need or anybody else needs while I'm sending some things out? Everybody's got what they need in terms of books. Lance, can you um, do a voice recording for me? Sure, what would you like? The White Tara um, recitation from last week. I think I had messaged you, but I forgot to follow up. It was really late one night. I sent you a text message. Oh. Um, Just so I can make sure I'm saying the pronunciations right. Yes, I've got that and um, I will send that to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And Zara, I got to be honest, you did ask me for that. And I think I, I, I prepared it, but I didn't send it to you. So I'm just, I'm just asking because I don't know what pronunciations are those? The pronunciation. Talking about the pronunciations of the Tibetan or the Sanskrit, the mantras and so on. Is that what you mean? what this lady was referring to. I think to the mantra, to the white tar mantra. Okay. Thank you. So we've got recordings. I did a recording in my uh, limited ability. And we also have a recording of uh, Garchi Rinpoche doing the recitation. So uh, I'll send you both. And maybe, you know, between the two, it'll be helpful to you. So if anybody else would like that, I'll send it to you all if you want. Okay. All right, so uh, tonight we're talking about chapter 11 in the uh, Learning Buddhism book. And chapter 11 is the uh, discussion about the seven branches or the seven branch prayer or the seven limb prayer, sometimes called the seven limbs. So we've been over this a number of times. So I would like to ask everybody, um, what do you recall about this? What are the seven branches? What are, what are they des designed to do? Anybody answer that question? Now you are you asking what the seven branch prayers are or what the, what the seven branch prayers? I mean, well, I'm asking are, generally or... what what is the seven branch prayer? You know, what is the purpose of the seven branch prayer? Let's well, prepare us. 
to uh, for our practice as far as uh, our correct mindset our it's almost like a um, a set of um, not rules but of uh, steps that we should follow as far as uh, going about um, our practices, our daily lives, our because uh, uh, you know, uh, like the first one is uh, what, uh, well. Let me prospect. excuse me. Let me let me ask Gary because Gary Gary had had a point. He wanted to, so before we get into the detail of it, I'm looking for a particular answer here. Gary, go ahead. Well. What I remember reading and what I've read is purifying obscurations. Um, and each of the seven branches is a step in doing that. The first of which I remember is, 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 is my nemesis prostrations. Okay, so hold on. All right, so what I'm looking for is that what this is, is a structure, is a framework. It's the seven branches of like a tree or a skeleton that becomes the framework of all the different sadhana practices that we do, all the deity yoga practices that we do. So, so to begin to think of it in that way, you know, now you begin to see that the, the, the common thread that runs through all of these sadhanas are all hanging on this seven limb prayer or the seven branch prayer. So it's important to recognize these things. You know, these are the, the subtle things that these masters over, you know, the many, many generations have designed in order that we can become better practitioners and so on. So, so understanding what the meaning of this is, is very important from the very beginning. That it's a framework, it's a structure that all the practices are hung on. So by knowing one of these, knowing the structure, we know all these different practices, what to look for in those practices. So now, what are those elements? There's obviously seven branches to them. So what's the first branch? So Tom, what would you say is the first branch? Uh, Gary's nemesis, prostrations. <laughs> Well, it's it's not a frustrations per se. Refuge. It's refuge. Mm -hmm. It's refuge. And we perform prostrations in a mode of being able to express our homage and our 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 respect of, of refuge to the three jewels, to the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, and so on. But the first one is refuge. So Gary, what's the second one? The microphone's on. Okay, I'm on the spot. I know that making offerings. That's right. Uh, That's right. And it does, it, 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 my offerings is multi-dimensional. It's just, it, it's not like, just money, it can be deeds, it can be uh, 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 um, um, a multifaceted expression of uh, your faith in seeking, in seeking uh, peace and emptiness and clarity. Um, I know I'm not finding the right words, but I, I hope I'm headed in the right direction there. Yes, you are. Thank you. So. All right, so the first one is refuge, and then the next one is offerings. The third one, does anybody uh, want to answer that? What's the third of the seven limbs, the seven branches? Michael? Uh, the third one would be the um, confession. All right, confession, wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think that includes? Um, <clears throat> that includes uh, any violations of monastic uh, 
values or practices um, or were designed to, but all of those definitely apply to the lay people. And then, uh, and then any, um, any actions uh, co committed as a result of, of the poisons. How about just, you know, mental misconceptions, you know, uh, being confused about wisdom or being confused about any ritual or anything like that? Uh, yeah, and mispronouncing and uh, just generally misrepresenting. Yeah. Gary, did you have something you wanted to say to that? You know, mis mispronouncing struck a chord with me. I just, I just yeah. did a lot of that. Yeah. Well, I want to say you did a very good job tonight. You, you know, your phrasing was was very good, and uh, so you're coming along very well. It was wonderful. And are you are you listening to any recordings to to get the phrasing? Uh, well, not necessarily recordings of that particular passage, but I, I, I. Uh, listen on uh, YouTube. I uh, listen um, to to chanting, and even though the words may not be the same, somehow I think that the energy comes across um, is imparted that gives you a sense of uh, of uh, of what chanting is. I don't have the sense that it needs to be any particular melody or tone that you, you can chant. You know, I, I tried not to use a monotone. I chanted. It might not be the same one. It certainly would not be, I hope, the one that you would use. But just to try to, to express the power behind the mantra. And, and the chanting may take, in my view, many forms um, uh, as, as, as long as it's conveying your energy and sense of commitment um, to what the sutras are. Okay, very good. So the third one was confessing wrongdoings. So that has many different ways of looking at that. So what's the fourth one? Does anybody recall that? The fourth branch, Zara. Rejoicing, but in the spirit of this conversation, I have a website pulled up okay. to be completely honest and forthcoming with the information. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, you know how to reference material. That's good. I, I, yeah, I pulled it up after you all started talking so I could read the additional context. So I'm just, I thank you for, <laughs> for so, your- so in rejoicing, what are we rejoicing? Zara? Oh, oh, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's well, um, achieving your Buddha holy body. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound good. I need to ask Michael to tell <laughs> Michael. Well, here in this chapter, it specifically says rejoicing in the merit. Okay. So re rejoicing in the merit of being engaged in the Dharma practice, being in this particular case, a sadhana and so on, but also rejoicing that we are, you know, that we're um, bringing, recognizing the deity within us and the deity family and so on, that we're on this path. So it's rejoicing this, to, uh, so we should be happy about all of this. So then the fifth one, what is the fifth of the branch? Somebody else, please. Right. Wheel of the Dharma be turned. I'm sorry, go ahead and say that again. Wheel of Dharma be turned to request. Requesting the, wheel of Dharma requesting the Dharma wheel or the Dharma teachings be told. So it's requesting from the... Uh, from the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, and in particular, the Dharma protectors to uh, continue teaching. So we're requesting the, the teachings from them. You know, so all the different doctrinal teachings and all the different 
of ritual teachings and all the different practices would all be included in that. So the so we say about the Buddhas and we say about the um, we say about the uh, 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 the Bodhisattvas, but more specifically here, we're talking about the Lamas, we're talking about the teachers, we're talking about those who are in the Sangha along with us to continue those teachings. So we're requesting teachings from them. And we, we say Dharma protectors because many of them are inspired by the Dharma protectors. The Dharma protectors are these enlightened beings who have gone through a period of being non-virtuous. But then through circumstances, they realize what they have done and they have kind of um, transcended their negativity, their non-virtue, and they have taken up the responsibility of maintaining the Dharma teachings, make sure the books are available, make sure that there's Sangha, make sure that there's facility for it and so on. So many of the teachers and, and the, the, the Dharma groups and so on are expressions of those Dharma protectors. So we're re re requesting teachings from them. So then the sixth one, what is the sixth branch? That the teachers stay, that they remain. And who continue. are the teachers in this case? So here, here in this prayer, it's specifically saying that the Buddhas remain, that the living Buddhas remain, you know, that they don't go to Parinirvana, that they stay with us, that to continue our teachings and so on. So the first requesting was for lamas, you know, our, our teachers in the Sangha, but here in this next one is like beseeching the Buddhas not to leave us, you know, to have long life and to remain uh, to continue to teach uh, the Dharma and, and give the empowerments and, and so on like that. Not, so not to get stuck here, but a question occurs to me, not just now, but at other times. So in requesting them to stay, there's implicit within that, that there's a desire being expressed on our part. And ultimately one of the things that we want to wash away is the desire state so we're by asking them to stay stay we're clinging we're grasping and um, they may accede to the request to to move us along but at the same time it seems to me that as practitioners that we need to be aware or I need to be aware that I'm grasping, that I'm understood. And you bring up a good point. And and to me there's there's two aspects to this question, you know. Number one is the word using desire. Because desire has, I think, a some kind of a connotation of of a lustful passion, desire for, you know, for possessions, desire for, you know, uh, pleasures of the flesh and so on like that, you know, but what we're talking about here is having an aspiration for something that is transcendent. So I prefer to use the word aspiration and to think of it in terms of this, that we have an aspiration to be able to lift ourselves up, to be able to become enlightened, and that by requesting these prayers and beseeching these Buddhas and so on to continue to teach is an aspiration for us to be able to fulfill the second part, which is our motivation is not for our own enlightenment, but for the enlightenment of other beings. So we're keeping that intention pure. We're keeping that motivation pure. We're keeping that aspiration pure by not selfishly desiring that or aspiring for that for ourselves, but for the benefit of the enlightenment of other beings. So I think it's those two points that purify that beseeching, that, that particular question. Does that make some sense? 
Well, it yes, it makes some sense. And as you were speaking, a thought that came to me was in the Sufis, and the Sufis talk about the seeker and the sought, which are ultimately one and the same. So aspiration would be a, a seeking. We may change the words from desire and 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 call it dress it up with aspiration, but it's still um, I, I don't want to get stuck here or to focus just on my question or concern. It's just something that came up with me prior to tonight's session. I well, no, it's a good question. And the and these understood words are more important now. You know, and uh, we were talking about, you know, last night when we were talking about the uh, the uh, Bardo Todal and we were talking about habitual tendencies. You know, so what what feeds those tendencies, what supports those tendencies and how can we use, you know, our our practices to be able to make those habitual tendencies become pure habitual tendencies. So this is, to me, this is one way through, through the words that we use to express ourselves to try and make them more meaningful in whatever fashion that we need to, to understand the pure nature of these words, these, these thoughts and so on. <clears throat> Lance? Yes. Uh, isn't it with this particular thing we're talking about here, uh, isn't it that we're asking someone to do something um, it just period asking them to do something and it's not necessarily for us, it's for all sentient beings, but at, at the point that we get, when we get to the point that we're asking this of the bodhisattvas and, and, and the, the uh, Buddhas, uh, we're evolved more than what we are now, and it's not uh, it, it's a new point, uh, not involving us at all, but involving the entire universe that, that, that we're holding, we're trying to hold together in our hands to, to uh, help enlighten. Well, yeah, I think so. I think having that broad view that, as you say, it's not for us personally, but it's for all beings to be able to bring enlightenment to all beings to be able to overcome, you know, the suffering of samsara. So yes. So we're we're in this case we're talking about this beseeching the spiritual teachers to remain, and in this case it's the the Buddhas themselves to remain, the living Buddhas. Like take for instance, Garchen Rinpoche. Garchen Rinpoche is considered to be a living Buddha by many, many, many people all around the world. And so if, um, you know, his body is bound to give out one day, but we're saying to him, you know, we beseech you to return quickly for our benefit because there's so much work that needs to be done and we need you to continue this work. Right. So... Stay here and stay here as much as you can to help us in our, in our um, right. Job. So this is all motivation, you know. This is this is to give us, you know, motivation for these practices to understand, you know, the the depth of meaning of these practices and so on, and how profound they are to all beings. Okay, so the, the seventh branch, what is the seventh branch? So, uh, Bonnie, do you have anything that you can say about what is the seventh branch of, of this? Well, the seventh branch is dedicating the merit 
And in the um, Pure Land tradition that we studied with, they always end their practice and sharing the merit of um, wishing that all beings be happy, all beings be well, and all beings be peaceful. Um, and when I, so whenever I think of sharing the merit, that's what comes to my mind. Well, very good, yes. And, and here in this prayer, you know, we're, we're stating that we're, we're not selfishly holding on to these things, but we are generously giving these things to all beings, that we're offering whatever we uh, attain, whatever wisdom, whatever merit we attain uh, is being offered to all beings and so on. So this dedication is part of the seven branches, is part of every sadhana that we do. So in all the because is it because that's why we practice? Of course, yes. Yeah. So, you know, so here what I'm trying to emphasize in this in this chapter is that we're aware of what the structure of this is. You know, that there's something here that we need to be part of and 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 be able to communicate to others and so on and to have a, a structure and able to do that because if we don't have this structure, then we start getting lazy. You know, if we don't realize what we're doing, we don't recognize these things and so on. So we have to uh, guard ourselves against that. You know, it's part of the eightfold path to always be evaluating ourselves and to have the right effort and the right perseverance. And to do that, we need structure, you know, so we need to take responsibility for that. And here is a perfect example of how this structure is, has been uh, manifested for us to be able to intellectually comprehend and then use. So these seven branches, then we should know these things very well. And we should look when we get a, when we get a, a sadhana that we're about to do, and we have time to be able to, you know, look over the, the sadhana to find the seven branches that is embedded in the sadhana. Sometimes they are very distinct sections. The seven sections would be very well defined. But sometimes it might just be a word or it might be a phrase or it might even be just implied. The, the confession might be like that. The rejoicing might be like that. The requesting might be like that. They're not expressed clearly but they are implied, but they're in there. So to, to become familiar with these sadhanas in this way is very important. You know, that we, we need to become the embodiment of these deities. And these deities are evoked through these practices. So the this, this system is coming together. We need to be able to harness the power of the system, intellectualizing it, and then, after we, we do that and the, 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 the machinations of it, you know, it just becomes second nature. It becomes our natural way. So we need to be able to create the structure for ourselves first, and then the naturalness comes right out of that. So what are the Now, to get a little bit, we talked about the structure. Now, what are we trying to do in with these uh, practices, with this seven limb practice or the seven branch practice? What are we trying to do um, to purify ourselves? So, Tom, I'm going to come back to you. Tom, what do you think about that answer? What are we trying to do? to overcome this non-virtue. <sighs> well, I think you said it before. But um, in, uh, as far as uh, what are we trying to do as far as 
rephrase that question again or what are we why are we trying to do these things in the first place what is the you know the seven branch prayer the sadhana practices the deity yoga practices what are we trying to do at its at its fundamental level now i know we're trying to achieve enlightenment mm -hmm. but what is it that's keeping us from enlightenment our obscurations okay so what are we trying to do then? We're purifying our obscurations. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to purify our obscurations. And we're not doing it by just saying, I'm going to do it. We've got a method to be able to do it. We've got a plan. We've got a system at work. And we have to recognize that that's what we're doing. I think everybody here you know, who has been with us for the past year or two years or so, can see the changes that have gone in your lives and how more pure you have become in the way that you think and the way that you, you act. Would anybody want to discuss that, argue that? All right. No argument. All right, so we can we can see that. So we're. I did want to say one thing, Lance. Sure. Over the years, I've become my biggest critic. You know, because uh, it's so easy to pass judgment on others, and to criticize others, and to uh, to be negative in general. But um, I always try to step back and and say, you know. Honestly, what what do you know? What do you know, Tom? And that really puts things in perspective a lot of times. You know, it uh it brings you down and it humbles you. A lot of times we need some humbling, you know, because um, um it is so hard, it's so easy to be so prideful and arrogant, you know, especially when we have a little bit of knowledge of something. And to pass judgment on others and say, oh, you know, that's not how I learned it. That's not how it should be. You know, it should be this way, not that way. But, but you know, I always tell myself, what, what, what the hell do you know? So are you talking about ordinary mundane things or are you talking about spiritual things? Oh, spiritual things, mundane, all, all things, you know, in general. Because especially, you know, being in contact with so many um, people on the path, you know, and uh, People coming from different cultures and different uh, studies and different uh, um, yanas, you know, and, uh, and you know, you always, you know, in, in whatever uh, step that or whatever uh, path that you took is, you know, and the uh, the teachings that you received, you know, that you know, and you're you're pretty stuck in that those ways and thinking that's you know that's that's the way it should be, you know, you should you should go through discipline, you should then you should go through, you know. Uh, dedication and then devotion and then faith and and then you know then when you when you step back and really look at look at yourself you know you're like well honestly you know is there really a wrong answer or is there a, a wrong point of view you know we're all buddhas since we're all buddhas we can't be wrong well let's let's look at it from this point of view <laughs> so if we recognize that we have obscurations and that we're trying to purify our obscurations and that as we engage in the practices we engage in this system and so on there are some results so how would we discuss that what are the results what's what's how do we express that So here in this chapter, it's very clear, you know, it uses these words. It says that we are gathering accumulations. We're accumulating merit and we're accumulating wisdom. The wisdom is this body of knowledge, you know, and we're refining things that we know are our mental misconceptions and so on. We're, we're, we're fine tuning all of that and so on. And then out of that wisdom comes our ability to be able to use it for method, to be able to use it for compassion. And this is where the merit comes from, because we're doing these things, and now merit comes. 
The wisdom itself doesn't necessarily make merit. The merit comes in doing for others. So if we look at this, that what we're doing to purify our obscurations is that we're gathering accumulations. So every time we do a practice, every time we engage in a study, every time we listen to teachings and so on, we're accumulating wisdom and merit, skillful means, method, wisdom, grace, loving kindness. So as, as this you know, gets higher and higher, gets more more part of us, we become more the embodiment of that. We do, you know, we do improve. There's always room for improvement. So the point that you were making about, yes, there's so much that I don't know, but there's so much that we have learned, so much that we have practiced, and it's not perfect because of our limitations. So we keep an open mind despite the fact that we've learned these things because there might be better ways to be able to, to learn it or to express it, to be able to understand it and so on. So we always keep an open mind. So I think that's, you know, that's what you were saying, you know, so we have improved and we need to be, you know, aware of that and recognize that. You know, as we do the, the deity yoga, when we get deeper into the deity yoga practices and what the lamas teach when they give an empowerment to do a deity yoga practice, one of the things that they always talk about is what they call deity pride. Now, deity pride is something that you recognize that you have this within yourself and it is not a arrogant pride. But it is a pridefulness that, that is this joyousness that you have within yourself to recognize this. And we're doing it for the benefit of others. So it's not like a spiritual pride that we might get to say, oh, I'm such a great practitioner. I'm so much better than all these other people and so on. That's negative. That's an example of a, of a pridefulness that is non-virtuous. But deity pride comes from recognizing that which is within ourselves. And now we begin to express that. We begin to show that. We begin to be the embodiment of that. So whatever deities we might have done in the not too distant past, whether it was Shen Rei, Zegar Manju Shri, or, or Tara, or Medicine Buddha, you know, there should be a sense that we are developing this deity pride. Can you, can you relate to that? You know, because a number of us have been doing Medicine Buddha practice regularly. Have you seen an accumulation of that awareness in your lives? Tom, William, Bhavani, Gary, what do you think about that? Michael? When you talk about deity pride, you're talking about recognizing our, our true nature as being indifferent from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, that we are all of same nature, that we are all the same. And, you know, um, I, I guess that is why we, we uh, when you, when you first started doing a lot of the teaching this year, you know, a while back, you said, when these empowerments come up, take these empowerments. Because when you, when you take the empowerments, it basically allows you to come into the mandala of these deities, to be in their, into, their, into their palace. And that allows you to become closer, actually to recognize that you are, you are them and they are you and you are one. And without taking the empowerments, is what, what, what is the uh, saying goes, is trying to squeeze oil out of sand. You can try it and try it and just, you know, or, or, or swing a rock in the air and try to hit the air. You, know, it's, you can do that, but, um, but I see, I, I really see the point in taking these empowerments because uh, uh, 
they're so beneficial. And there, 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 is, there is a certain, I don't know if that's the right word, it's power, but yeah, empowerment, the power that, that the lamas bestow upon you to do these deity, uh, to, do, to do these uh, yoga practices. And it's very powerful. It's very powerful. You know? So what is the essence of this? You know, by doing these things, by doing these deity yogas, by, by having this deity pride, what is the essence of what that means? When we talk about the essence of our, of our Buddha nature, what is the term we always use? It's so basic that all the enlightened ones share. I, I think that's taking over uh, and, and, and taking over and um, taking uh, taking the, the When when we sit here and we talk about it back and forth, that's one thing. That's that's one level, but that doesn't even come close to 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 doing anything with with it. When we when we take and when we take the the practices and 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 it, it absorb them into ourselves and make that a way of our life. This, this practices make that a way of our life. Uh, taking and um, um, ag aggressively going after uh, this, the, the what, 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 what Bodhicitta is. All right, there's the word. That's what I was looking for. Isn't that the common essence that all these enlightened ones have? The holy enlightened mind. Bodhicitta. We've got Bodhicitta within ourselves. It's, you know, we use this example, this diamond nature, but it's all covered up. And there are times when, you know, little shards of, of, shards of light come through of that bodhicitta when we're doing things, but we may not recognize it as bodhicitta. We don't understand it. We just think we're doing, we're just a nice person. We're doing these things. Gary? Um. I really struggled with this. I, I, I think of it because it, 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 it seems so overwhelming to me, but uh, if deity pride is anything to me, it's uh, like a weaving together of all of the Dharma teachings and, and finding a way to let them uh, find expression in the way we live our lives and relate to others. Um, I'm not very far along, but one of the first things I discovered that uh, was uh, in relating to people and giving to people, uh, my opinion of most anything doesn't matter very much. It's listening to them and trying to understand why they are thinking what they're thinking and try to move both them and me towards some sort of peace. Because uh, when I'm out and about, I encounter contention every day. And there's the opportunity to participate in it or to try to find uh, subdue is not the right word. If you can make 
uh, in, uh, how this relates to deity pride, I think it does. If you could make someone understand that you're trying to understand them, then I think that you're doing the things, at least one of the important things about bodhicitta should do and a Buddha should do. And even if they're wrong in what they're saying, if they believe they're being heard, and if the world believes it's being heard, then they'll think more about what they're saying and thinking. And so will I. Well, I think that's really good. I think that's really practical, you know, uh, in the way that that bodhicitta is being expressed. You know, how often do you think about bodhicitta in your day? Uh, really, uh, I, I do think about it often, and one of the reasons I think about it often is um, I, I think about it when I encounter my own reactions to a lot of things that are, are disturbances. Yeah, the, um, I have grown up, and I think most of us have, in a world where um, we we think we must always find definitive solutions for things and i don't think that that's what bodhicitta is all about the solutions find themselves if you find that quietness in yourself and can impart it to other people if they can feel it from you well wait a minute i want to talk about that you know i mean because because you know from from the way I think about this, and we can talk about it, we can have a difference of opinion. But the bodhicitta, but the bodhicitta <laughs> is the essence of the of the holy enlightened mind. Yeah. And 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 that ha and out of that will come all the wisdom. Out of that will come all the skillful means and the merit that is accumulated as a result of that skillful means. But if the if the bodhicitta isn't there, then things, you know, begin to get lost. What do you think about that? I'm trying to process what you're saying. I'm trying to say that the bodhicitta is the essence of our goodness. Without it. We get lost. So the, the so be, becoming completely the embodiment of that bodhicitta is incumbent upon what it is that we're doing with all these practices and everything is to become stable in our bodhicitta, our awareness of bodhicitta, our expression of bodhicitta. So let's come back. Does anybody else have, have a comment about this? Yes. Thomas? Well, the first thing that occurs to me is the Hinayana. And as far as I understand it, they don't have the concept of bodhisattva at all. That's something that came along with uh, Mahayana. So that's one thing that comes up. Another thing is this will take just a moment, but not long. In, um, in business and in engineering, when they're really trying to solve a problem, sometimes they use a thing called root cause analysis. And if they don't, if they put the fix on and the problem continues, then they didn't get to the root of it. So they got to keep digging until the problem goes away. So my understanding is that if one thinks of bodhicitta as something, let, let's call it a skill to be acquired. So just put that on the shelf for a minute. If, if one goes down the road of reducing self-grasping, putting oneself first, if one reduces that in their everyday behavior, in very simple ways, then the bodhicitta naturally arises because when you're 
not looking out for yourself, if you're not putting yourself first, if you're not grasping, if you're letting go of self grasping, then other people come ahead. And you're you're thinking of their welfare, their well being, their whatever it is that you're not thinking of yourself first. So in that regard, the bodhicitta, rather than being something, is is just the work we're doing is on ourselves to get rid of the ego, to get rid of our fixation on ourselves. And so the bodhicitta is a product of that. That's my understanding. Well, anybody else got a comment about that? When I think of that, Lance, I think of um, expressing and giving loving kindness to all that I meet and maybe even not ones that I meet to all um, and keeping my, my ego out of the way. I'm not saying that I'm there. I'm saying that that would be my intention. Okay. I, I think that mainly it's the discovery that we're all one. And anything that I do to you, I'm actually doing to myself. And when we discover this, we make a change in our attitudes, our uh, life, lifestyle, and everything like that, because of the fact that we are one. And being one, we actually represent everyone and everything that's on the earth. Okay, so is bodhicitta something that is innate or is it something that is learned and cultivated? Isn't that part of the Buddha nature that we all have that we've gotten away from and are trying to refine? Okay. Michael, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have come to see bodhicitta as, um, as like a, a, a thread uh, with four um, different materials spun into it or, or even, even a, a fabric um, because it's... Uh, the joy, equanimity, those, those are the things that the, the, the components of bodhicitta as, as I know them are all of those things that I can impact through my behavior and my understanding of them and in my daily life. But the way those are all woven into um, the thread that makes up the, the fabric of of my of my path uh it's like what i'm wearing at the moment um i think that opens up uh, a lot of room for um for self-authorship but at the same time uh none of those ingredients were made in the usa uh you know the the at the at the base level at the ground level Every, every resource that I'm using anyway was given to me. I'm just working the spinning wheel, the way it works for me, the way, you know, the way I'm thinking it should work, and then creating the fabric, designing that fabric that uh, for me uh, is, uh, is going to be my path to, to freedom. Okay. I know Amazing. that's... Uh, let me invite Zara and Kate to comment. 
Do you have any comments? Is bodhicitta innate or cultivated? Is that the question? Yeah, that was posed. Yeah. What do you think? So if I may, then I think it's both. And the reason is, if I may mention this, when there is an innate nature within all of us, and it's very quickly obscured. And that's due to various reasons that we're all aware of. But yes, I think at the very heart of us all, it is true. It is real, innate within us, bodhicitta. And then I think the more safe our overall environment is, that the easier that natural bodhicitta that exists within all of us arises and shows itself and is made into practice in everyday life. That part of us that is so quickly blown out, uh, be told this is a certain way, it has to be this way, this is wrong, this is right, you're very quickly, you're so quickly taught that. So we then are put in these little boxes and these little titles are given to us and we think that it should be this way or that way, so on and so forth. So yes, it is absolutely innate within all of us. And yes, it has to be continually cultivated because of the obscurations that we are bombarded with. And that's just, I think okay. that's the nature of this realm, the duality, reality okay. of this. All right, thank and you. Zara, did you have a comment? I don't want to leave you out of the conversation. Well, I think she's... So the question came up, you know, Thomas raised a good question when he, when he said, you know, that, that bodhicitta wasn't recognized until, uh, until the Mahayana. So does that mean it didn't exist at the time of the Hinayana, or was it just not recognized in practice? So the question then becomes, did the Buddha have bodhicitta? Was not the Buddha until the time that Mahayana came up, wasn't Buddha, you know, everything was being taught as the Hinayana. You know, for the most part, Mahayana was still being taught, Vajrayana was still being taught at that time, but not everybody recognized it. As, as his teachings. So the point I'm trying to make is, did the Buddha have bodhicitta? And of course the Buddha had bodhicitta. But many of the practitioners during the time of the, of the Hinayana practices, those who were practicing, were, were selfishly motivated out of their own fear that if they didn't find enlightenment, they were gonna wind up in some kind of hell or something like that. And as a as a as a as a safeguard to that, they said, "Oh, I got to take up these practices. Oh, I got to find enlightenment. I got to do enlightenment." And that became our their motivation. It wasn't necessarily the bodhicitta, but the bodhicitta then got emphasized in the Mahayana teaching. But it was there the whole time. It's innate within us. We have Buddha nature within us. It's innate within us, but it's all blocked up and confused. It's our natural state. And what we're trying to do is to recognize all that stuff that's blocking it up so that that innate nature, that true nature, that bodhicitta comes out. And everything we do is motivated, is but is an expression of bodhicitta. So, in doing that, then everything that we do, like I just said, then becomes an expression of that bodhicitta. I'm saying it around it a, a different way, but, but the questions of whether we're doing the right thing or not, if we're doing it out of bodhicitta, it kind of corrects itself. It becomes, it becomes our focal point. It becomes the essence. And if we set that essence in our mind, 
every day, more and more, it becomes second nature to us. It becomes the way we operate all the time. This is what we're trying to do. And in many of the prayers and so on, we, we recite this over and over again. And this is why it's so important to recite those prayers, to refresh our memory on this. It, and somebody said, and it's really true, that it's so easily suppressed because it's very subtle and it needs to be cultivated. We need to be aware of it all the time. Our ego is so strong in so many different ways. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, Bodhicitta is like my car out in front of the house. It needs a wax job and it needs to be waxed and polished and shined so it looks brand new again. And that would, that would be like Bodhicitta. Uh, I, I've got it, it's there, but it needs a wax job to bring it out, to bring out all of the things in there. Okay, very good, it's a good simile. So, <laughs> to get back on track on what we're talking about tonight are the seven branches. Seven branches are a method, is a structure for us to be able to hang our practices, to have repeatable practices so that we can purify our obscurations and accumulate, gather the accumulations of wisdom and merit, skillful means. So we need to do this. So how do we do this now? So we do this first with refuge and the refuge is characterized here in this chapter with prostration that what we are doing, we're taking refuge with the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the three jewels. We're taking refuge with the three roots. We're taking three refuge with the three delights. There's many, many different aspects of, of this refuge. And the more we get into different practices, the more we see those. But the very basic is the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The, the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. So we're realizing that we take prostrations in order to um, help us to break our arrogance that we know things and that, and that there is not something that is greater than we are. So we're surrendering that arrogance by way of these prostrations to the three jewels, the Buddha, the, the, the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha, which is within ourselves. And when we break through that ego, we begin to have these awarenesses, this wisdom becomes to come up. We begin to see the changes that we go through. We begin to recognize the bodhicitta that has been there, you know, and, and that we become more, um, uh, uh, well, we become more aware of it and we practice it more and so on. So we go through the process of doing the, the prostration. So unless somebody needs to go through the detail of that, we'll move on to the next thing, which is the um, offerings. Does anybody need to talk about the, the prostrations? The mechanics of the prostrations? Okay, it's expressed in this book and you can read this chapter and see it. Bonnie, did you have something, but Bonnie? That I wanted to add. I hear Gary coming down on himself about prostrations. Um, we're both in a situation right now because of physical things that we can't do these prostrations that are described. But to me, when I fold my hands in prayer, I'm doing prostrations. When I do the Om uh, Hung, I'm doing prostrations. It doesn't have to be full out laying out on the floor. It's more my mental image and feeling when I do it. Correct. It's your conviction, you know, what your motivation is. Yes. So yes, it's the emanated and the same thing with offerings. 
You know, we may have meager ways of being making offerings. You know, we, we talk about the, the offerings of drinking water and washing water and, and uh, incense and candlelight and so on like that. And maybe we, we don't have much more ability to be able to do something like that. But we can visualize that we're offering many, many more things, all the food, all the riches, all the, the, the good virtues and everything that are being offered to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that are within ourselves. Remember, it's all within ourselves. We're offering this within ourselves that they may shine their light within ourselves and radiate that light to all beings. So yes, so the power of being able to visualize these things is very, very important. It's very fundamental about this. And remember, so many of these practices are, are designed for those who are young, you know, in, in the monasteries. So for 70-year-old, some people, 60-year-old people, 50 people, 50-year-old people who have you know, physical ailments to be able to do these prostrations would be a real hardship. Wouldn't be possible without really hurting themselves. But we can still do something as simple as this. And if we have a problem with our arms, we can do it with one hand, or we can just imagine that we're doing it. You know, so, and the same thing again with the offerings, that we're making these offerings you know, of things, of possessions that we have and so on. So these offerings have no rules to them. They have no limits to them. We think of them as being beautiful and, uh, and uh, valuable and, and being of benefit to the Buddhas. Not that they need these, but the Buddhas just take this and, and just shine it right through. It just comes out to them. You, you were, were igniting their light and then it just shines out. It just comes right back into us. And then it goes right back out to all sentient beings. So it becomes a benefit to ourselves to accumulate merit by making these offerings. And this becomes an antidote to our greed and our miserliness. So the, the prostrations or the refuge is um, developing humility is developing an antidote to the afflictive emotions of pride and arrogance. So by doing those, we're doing that, but we're overcoming pridefulness and arrogance. By doing generosity of, of, uh, of offerings, we're overcoming our miserliness. So being aware of these, you know, this is in the chapter, you know, and it's, it's so fundamental. And if you don't have the book, I did send the text. I sent a PDF of this chapter to everybody. So, you know, you can print that out or you can look at it online and you can read it and study it, you know. But, but you know, we got to have a, a breakthrough of standing by passively and letting these things come into us and are not assimilating them, are not digesting them of our not making these part of who we are. We need to be able to, to, uh, to um, understand these things and how they operate and so on. And it is a circle. It goes around and round and round. And it should become easier and easier the more we do it. But we have to jump on board and start doing these things. So it's not a, it's not a passive practice. It's an active process. So then the next thing is confession, our wrongdoings. And then here we have, we have to purify our mind stream, confessing our wrongdoings, confessing the confusions, confessing our negativities, our non-virtues. And we, we do that you know, through our Vajrasattva practice when we develop the four powers, the power of regret, the power of support, the power of antidote and resolve. And these are the essential aspect of the antidotes to wrongdoing by confessing that I made mistakes, that I did these things, or I didn't do them when I had the opportunity. So maybe we, we, we're escaping responsibility by saying, well, I didn't do anything. But by not doing something, you're, 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 you're evading the whole thing. You're, you're becoming lazy. 
So uh, that doesn't relieve you of responsibility of being able to embody, you know, this purification of confessing. So the entirety of the Dharma, all of the Dharma practices really is in effect, the antidote to hatred and anger. So this confession becomes part of that, becomes, you know, I was mad. I'm sorry I was mad. You know, I got angry with somebody. I got angry with myself, you know. Um, you know, to me, that's the worst thing when, when you're angry with yourself. You know, it's really bad when you're angry with somebody else. Let me turn that around. I think it's really bad when you show that anger to somebody else. But when you really realize it within yourself that that's what you're doing, that's where you realize that you got to fix that. You got to really, really come out and fix that. So then we rejoice in the merit of, of doing this. We're rejoicing. So rejoice in all the happiness and virtue of ourselves and all sentient beings. Virtuous actions, wealth, success, health, favorable circumstances. Rejoicing in the antidote of jealousy. This becomes the antidote to jealousy. That we're rejoicing. I may not have these things. These other people may have these things. I have a propensity to become jealous of them. But if I'm able to rejoice that these people have that and what a wonderful thing it is for them and they do this, you know, so unselfishly for other beings, I rejoice in that. And that helps me to overcome my jealousy. So by rejoicing that all this is in our midst. And when we do that, you know, when we, when we do our, many of our prayers and so on, and we uh, we do the offerings, and at the at the end of the offerings, when we're we're doing the mudras and so on, and we ring the bell. This is rejoicing. This is a, a, a making a joyful noise, becoming happy, and so on, and realizing the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are all within ourselves, and we're becoming realizing them. So that's rejoicing in the merit, having done these things. And then requesting the Dharma teachings. So now we're, we're requesting the, the, the teachers, the Dharma protectors, those to continue teaching, to dispel the darkness that surrounds my mind and all other beings and so on. So we're requesting the teachings. We're requesting, you know, the talks about um, the, 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 um, the Eightfold Path and the Four, uh, the four Truths and, and the, the Six Paramitas and and the, uh, the dual ornamental liberation, all these different things that we're requesting these teachings to come and that there's teachers to help us with that. Ultimately, we, we are the teacher, we are the guru within ourselves. But first we need to have this, this intervention, if you will, by those who have tread this path, who have been on this path themselves, who have realized these things themselves and can help us to develop our routine, our system, our structure of being able to become the embodiment of these ourselves. So we're requesting these teachers to remain with us. And this is the antidote to uh, wrong view, ignorance, by rejecting, uh, if we were to reject the Dharma, reject the Dharma. So we're asking these teachers to, to give us education about the Dharma. Otherwise, we suppress it. We, we fall away from it. It becomes darkness. We're not recognizing it. And then we're beseeching the spiritual teachers, the spiritual masters, who are the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, to remain for the benefit of beings because they can liberate their bodies and then they're gone, you know, but we want them to remain. They want, we want them to be reborn again. We want them to have their uh, emanations to continue and so on. So these enlightened ones, not to pass into paranirvana. So we recite these long life prayers for these masters. So in the book, the, um, 
the data yoga book that we have that we try at least once a week, you know, when we come together to do these, to recite these long life prayers to the Dalai Lama, to His Holiness Jatsang Rinpoche, to His Holiness the Chunsang Rinpoche, and to Garchin Rinpoche, and any of the other masters who are living, who are so important to us that we recite these as a means to be able to ignite a light that goes from our heart to their heart, that they may remain with us and continue teaching. So this is the antidote to a mind that is unhappy and full of afflictive emotions. If we have this mind that's full of afflictive emotions, we get this very depressed way, you know, and wow, you know, everything is, is the whole weight of the world is on me and so on. But if I recognize that there are those here to enlighten us, who have the power to enlighten us because they themselves are enlightened, that we need to beseech them to remain and to, and to continue teaching. Even if I'm not paying attention, please continue teaching. I'm, it's going to come through one day. I'm going to recognize it one day. But please don't go away. Please continue to teach. Be patient with me. You know, and, and one day it's going to break through. Lance. Yes, sir. It's funny that you uh, say that about the, uh, the teachings that uh, today I got a, uh, an email from uh, Kenshin, Kenshin Rinpoche. Right. Saying that he's not going to give any more teachings for a while. Right. For us to actually practice what we have learned. That's right. How many lamas have said that? <laughs> Not too many. <laughs> that's that's profound. Yes. Yeah. That's profound. And that's and that's part of what Kenshin. That's the power of Kenshin. You know, he is very profound, and he does these things and says these things that cut right through. You know, all this pretense and and so on of of being a a, a spiritual having spiritual pride, being a spiritual master, and, and so on. Oh, I got to teach, I got to teach, I got to do this, you know. Now it's time for you to practice. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to teach anymore until you do some practice. Yeah, yeah when, I re when, I saw that, when I saw that email, it just, uh, it really, really uh, hit my heart. And I was like, wow, that, that's very, very just profound that, uh, because, you know, he, he's a teacher, that's, he's a scholar, and that's what he does, you know, but it's like, I've taught you plenty now, put all that into practical use and practice with me, because you've been taught more than enough to be enlightened a hundred times, use it. Hmm. Yep, very good. So then this last is... Uh, Lance, stay though, uh, right? You're going to stay. <laughs> You're going to stay though, right? <laughs> like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for you to... <laughs> oh, well, well, thank you very much. Thing, but, uh, <laughs> but it doesn't relieve you of practicing. And that's, what, no, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to really facilitate practice. You know, so... In the not too distant future, we're hoping that we're going to be able to engage in some weekend practice with Dharma Surya and have it on Zoom for those who can't get there and to develop your own personal practice. And, and we've been talking about that. I know individually I've talked with most everybody about that. So number seven is dedicating the merit. So we have to dedicate the merit. This is the seventh branch. And so all virtue, the merit of our practice to the ultimate happiness of all beings so that it won't be depleted. So we're virtue, we're, we're dedicating all this virtue so it won't be depleted, that it continues and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. If we hold it to ourselves, then it just gets blocked up and it gets corrupted by our selfishness. So we make aspirations that all beings have temporary happiness. 
We make aspirations that all beings have temporary happiness because right now it's not possible for them to have the permanent happiness until they become masters of this phenomenal world and be able to understand that. It's not practical to say, oh, I hope you have you know, permanent happiness and you know, go out and have permanent happiness without showing you what it is that's holding you back and how it is that you overcome it. So we have to recognize this temporary impermanent nature that we have. So we dedicate our merit for their ultimate happiness to come. That the work that we're doing is continuing and dedicating that to the benefit of other beings. So all our virtuous actions for the benefit of others, the body, speech, and the mind of the Buddhas, the body, speech, and the mind of the Buddhas, the primary cause of enlightenment of all beings is the body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas. Everything that the Buddhas do with their body, speech, and mind is for the benefit of the enlightenment of all beings. And as we cultivate that within ourselves, as we say, I become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of the Buddhas and so on, we become that. And we find that that becomes our motivation. That, that when somebody asks us to do something, or we recognize that something needs to be done without somebody asking us, we, we, we go to help that, to make that possible. We go to fill that, to bring that with whatever it takes, my body, my speech, and my mind, to be able to help all beings. It becomes our motivation. That is the, the primary cause. That is the Shri syllable. You know when we do Om Mani Padme Hong? Shri, and that's the seed syllable. That's the primary cause of compassion of all the Buddhas, all the Buddhas. So we dedicate all virtuous actions to others. And this becomes the antidote to mind attachment. What does that mean? Mind attachment, that we attach ourselves to our mind, that we recognize that what we call our mind is just yet another concept and that this ultimate reality is beyond what we consider to be mind we don't we don't we can't understand it with what we call our mind you know we can say that we have this big mind and we use that as a simile the spiritual mind and that can only be experienced we can't intellectualize it with this mind so once we, we do that, and the more that we do that, the stronger that becomes, and the more that becomes our, our primary cause, that, that compassion, that primary cause of the body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas, all the enlightened ones. So this is the antidote to mind awareness that we can think this, that we can know this with our brain. It doesn't work that way. We think it works that way. We want it to work that way, but we have to break through that. Bajra Mu, you know, Om Maha Hong, Bajra Mu, the indestructible vow that breaks through. We endeavor to do all these things to, in order to break through, to engage in our practices, to break through. The breakthrough doesn't come from vicarious intellectual experience. It doesn't come from logic. It comes from experience. <clears throat> so that's this chapter. Everything I just said all came from that chapter. So what do you think? I have a question. Okay. On the last page in the chapter, it, it says we make aspirations that all beings have temporary ha uh, happiness. And then we dedicate our merit to their ultimate happiness. Right. Um, so 
in this sort of dual duality or this polarity of aspiration and dedication uh, what does an what does an aspiration look like is yeah can you can you tell me what it looks or sounds like well i think it's uh, an example is exactly what we're doing here you know we have aspirations that we are going to be able to to learn about the doctrine we're going to learn about in this case um the uh the seven branch prayer the structure the meaning of it and so on and, and this brings us a relative temporary happiness that we may master this intellectualization of what this is and then somebody can come along and say to you oh what are the seven <laughs> branches and you can rattle them right off because you've you've mastered them, but only within your, your brain, you've memorized them. It's a temporary thing. But then we're dedicating our merit that what we have done for us to be able to do that ourselves, now to go beyond that temporariness to the ultimate happiness, which is a, a metaphor for enlightenment, for liberation. You know, so it's not, it's not a, a dualism, but it is it is the liberation from that dualism. So so in this sense, um, aspiring is is literally um, um, verbalizing or making it clear that as to what our what our what what our vision is, what our wishes are for ourselves and other beings. Yeah, it, okay. it's, it's the thoughtfulness of it. Right. And then just to go back a minute, you know, uh, when we were doing Buddhism 101, uh, we talk about in the Jewel Ornament of Liberation that there is the uh, aspiration lineage, which is based on, on this lineage that comes from uh, Manjushri, this wisdom lineage of understanding what all this stuff is and so on, and understanding that. And then comes the action lineage. The action lineage comes from a Sangha. And now it's putting that to work, actually engaging in that for the benefit of other beings and so on. So the, the aspiration is that first part. And then the dedication of the, of the merit would be the second part, would be the action of putting that together, putting and making that happen. And then there's the secret lineage of the fruition of that, of that coming together. Oh, one more question. Um, I completely love when we do dedications and, and I do dedications in other, in other worlds, in other spaces that I, that I study in. Um, but is, is a kind of dedicating our merit um, can it also be action or behavior oriented? In, in other words, what I might gain, what I might learn, uh, can I, with my physical being, um, offer that to others? So like to join the Peace Corps or to, you know, help someone across the street or making, making use in this, in this uh, relative world. Uh, absolutely and that's what i was trying to say but i said poorly but you just you know you hit the nail on the head by saying this is the action things that we do these are the practical things that we do as a mode of that of those dedications okay so it's not just a prayer right. that would be an aspiration yeah. and an action is now you know hitting the hitting the nail with the hammer okay thank you So anybody else? So I hope this helps to, you know, solidify, you know, these things that we take for granted, that they need to be really fleshed out and they need to be really identified and, and, and recognized and used. 
over and over again. This brings me a lot of comfort. So I am very grateful for these teachings and I appreciate the Sangha uh, because for me, it, the Sangha is extremely, well, I mean that in the, the Sangha is very important to me and I, I hope to cultivate a relationship with, with the Sangha. And so these teachings, virtual, in person, Whatever medium they come in, I'm grateful for them. Well, good, thank you. And not everybody can can partake of these in, in the same degree, you know. So we have understanding of that. But whatever you can, you know, and try not to be lazy. Try not to be ambivalent about it. Okay, any other questions or comment? Sometimes I think that rather than trying to, speaking just for myself, trying to get the big picture, um, just little things kind of ignite sparks. So the other day you were talking about the position of the uh, sun seat and the moon seat and how they were reversed for the peaceful and the wrathful deities. And I had never heard that before. And it was uh, eye-opening. Just that little, just that little point. Sure. All these, you know, everything in Buddhism, everything in Tibetan Buddhism in particular here, has has meaning to it you know it's all very powerful it's uh, it, it's good stuff you know the artwork the statues you know the the altar all these things have meaning to them when we're the the second branch of offering uh it's 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 not necessarily how much or how often you give, but uh, it's with uh, how much devotion you give with, and how much how pure-hearted you are when you're giving. Yeah, and same with the prostrations. You know, doesn't matter if you do a hundred thousand or if you do one. It's how heartfelt you are doing that 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 prostration. You know, I think that's why we do 111,000. Hopefully that we can get at least one, one with true, true intention of, of uh, wanting to uh, help all sentient beings. You know, but if you have the karmic connection from past lives and you can do that with one prostration, you know, that's, that's beyond me. That's why I keep trying. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. And, you know, for a time, it may not seem to be working, but then all of a sudden it works. And then everything else just opens up. So, yeah, so we just keep on working at it, having faith, you know, keep on trusting and, and doing, and, uh, and eventually there will be a, a breakthrough. Bajra Mu, the indestructible vow that breaks through. All right, so thank you all for your comments and your, uh, your candor and so on. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, it gave some thought to things that we've been hiding within ourselves, keeping within ourselves. And, allows these things to come out and allowing yourself to speak about these things is really good and nobody's having any judgment about anybody and uh we're all here to help each other so uh i know that's true with everybody that's here so uh continue that and we'll continue growing thank you lance you're welcome thank you
and I'll send these books out uh, as soon as I can this week. So uh, let me see. So uh, Gary, uh, was it Gary? Gary was Omze tonight. So Gary, if you will uh, do our dedications for us, please, on page 18 through page um, 22. And Tom, I'm Thomas, I'm gonna send you a copy of this book. So you'll have this. Thank you. Dorje Chang, Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milrancha, Dharma Lord Gampopa, Fogmodrupa, and Lord Drinkupa. Please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessing of all the Kagyu Lamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all-knowing state. And may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri, the warrior realized the ultimate state and as did Samatabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all the merit for all sentient beings. By the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three Kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. A Korma prayer. By the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate root of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Drinkumpa Ratna Sri, who is omniscient Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. <clears throat> Dedication prayer by Lord Jington Sungan. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas. Divine assembly of Yidams and assembly of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Dakinis dwelling in the ten directions. Please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate root of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a Shravaka or Pratyaka Buddha. May all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Maras and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise even for a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dramata. May I, in any case, 
gained the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Om, ah, hum. Om, ah, hum. Om, ah, ha. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable from the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones. Very good. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Gary. You did a good job, Omze, tonight. Thank you for all the questions and the candor that everybody expressed. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, next you. week is Memorial Weekend. Uh, do you want to continue on with Saturday night, or should we uh, pass on next uh, Saturday? Lance, I will be traveling in a car next Saturday, literally with like three minor kids in a back seat. <laughs> so, right, like I'm helping my sister and my nieces and nephews. So I'm, I could probably participate on mute and audio out, but um, I probably will not be fully present. Just okay. complete transparency for myself. All right, thank you. How about other people? Can you, can you do it next Saturday or should we take a night off? The I, like, for us. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to continue. All right, we're all in? Okay, good. Okay. So, Zara, we don't want you to get hurt while you're driving or anything. Um, next week, uh, what I had planned to do is the purification practice that is here on page 23. So, we're going to do that practice and uh, talk about that. And uh, so, I think that's going to be our, our, uh, our next week session on Saturday night. Sounds good. I'll also, if, if I have any trouble, I'll also make sure I get onto the recording of okay, it. Great. Yeah. Thank are, you all. Are you going away for a long time or just for the weekend? No, I'm going to see my grandmother. She's 90. So I'm just going to do a road trip. She's um, taken a downturn since COVID started. So I'm just going to go see her. She's in a nursing home now. So okay. I'm going to go see her. All right. Well, very good. All yeah. right. Thank you all very much. If anybody has any questions, anything you want to talk about during the week, don't hesitate to let me know and we'll make a time and we can have a conversation. So uh, thank you. If you want to talk to each other, you can reach out and do that too. So uh, take care thank, of yourself. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you all, friends. Have a good weekend. Oh, and, uh, on Wednesday is Sagadawa. So there's going to be an event and... Uh, I got to send the flyer. We just got the flyer. So I'm going to send that out. So if you can join us on Saturday, uh, Wednesday, uh, we'll be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you.